Welcome church family. Uh, I'm coming to you this morning from our church's prayer garden right outside, uh, right outside the building. And I just want to wish you a happy Easter on this beautiful Easter sunrise morning. Uh, you know, the reason historic that the church celebrates Easter on sunrise is not just the fact that we want to get to it as soon as possible. But we recognize that as the light breaks through the darkness, so on Easter morning when Christ rose from the dead and um, defeating sin and death, creating a way that we could have a relationship with God, that it brings about new life. It brings out new light. It breaks into the darkness of our lives. This is also why so often churches will have flower crosses on this day because we celebrate the fact that out of death comes life in celebration. You know, over the last few months, we've been exploring what the church says about why Jesus died on the cross. Like, what, what did he do? How, how, how did he accomplish that? Uh, we call those the theories or, or the ways we grapple to explain the theories of atonement, how God made peace through Jesus Christ, so that we can be together again, uh, God and us. And on this Easter morning, I got a question for you. This whole idea of, of the, the sunlight breaking into the darkness, the, the flower cross, bringing about new life, these are images, these are ways that we have wrestled with trying to explain the unexplainable. What does it mean for you to know Jesus rose from the dead? I mean, for you personally, what, what, what does it mean? How, how does it make you feel? How, how, does it, how does it change what you think about Him? What He thinks about you? That loving God that comes after us and cares about us, y'all, that's who we're here to worship this morning. Uh, I want to say thank you to all the people who made this morning's worship service possible. So many people have invested their time, their love, their talents. Uh, we have uh, people reading scripture, we have musicians, we got vocalists, all blending together to tell the story of Jesus Christ on this morning. Uh, and as we get started here, I'm really excited, I'm, I'm anticipating getting to this with you, uh, but I also want to let you know that our 11 o'clock cantata service will also be online later today. So I invite you to come back and check that out as well. Also, if you have just finished up your Inspire Challenge, our Lenten Inspire Challenge here at Salem, we invite you to, don't forget, turn in your form. You can uh, bring it to the church. You can email it to us. You can just text it to me. Uh, I want to be able to get you your Inspire pin. Here it is. Mine's turning sideways. Okay. Uh, and remember, all donations that go towards that, 100% um, goes to help with hurricane relief in the state of Florida. Will you all join me for a word of opening prayer? Heavenly Father God, on this beautiful morning, as we literally sit in the garden, we are receptive to the fact that on that morning when those women came to the tomb and found it empty, and, and celebrate and wrestle with the fear and the joy and the confusion. So we too sometimes wrestle with how it is you could love us so much. How you could care about us knowing everything there is to know about us. But we pray, Lord, that as we receive that and celebrate the new life on this day that we are given, that everything we do is worship to you. Jesus, happy Easter to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please join us in singing Christ the Lord is Risen Today on page 302.
1 and 2, and 6 through 11. It's the triumphal entry. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into the village over there, he said, and as soon as you enter, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. So the two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt and sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of them, and the others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of this procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this? they asked. And the crowds replied, It's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Lord of joy and celebration, with faith like children, on this most holy morning, we join these voices in song and celebration, remembering he who came to be our King, Christ the Savior. And like this crowd, we joyfully anticipate his return someday, when he will welcome us into your eternity. Above all. Above all power, above all king, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and the ways of man, you were there before the world began. verses 26b through 30, the plot against Jesus and the Last Supper. Matthew 26, 2 through 5. 
and 26 day through 30 tells us that after sitting with his disciples on the Mount of Olives, teaching them many things, he said to them, As you know, Passover begins in two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. At that same time, the leading priest and elders were meeting at the residence of Caiaphas, Caiaphas, the high priest, plotting how to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the Passover celebration, they agreed, or the people may riot. Later that night, as they were eating the Passover, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of men. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. God of redemption and forgiveness, who joined these disciples this morning in the upper room, the very one who betrayed and rejected, he sat with them eating the sacred meal offering them the nourishment of reconciliation, acceptance, forgiveness, and hope. In our brokenness, we seek these same things this day, and thank you for offering this love to broken people, even broken people like us. Oh, how he loves you and me. How he loved you and me. Oh, how he loved you and me. He gave his life. What more could he give? Oh, how he loved you. Oh, how he loved me. Oh, how he loved you and me. arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them a prearranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas, Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and gave him a kiss. Jesus said, My friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. Very early in the morning, the leading priests and the elders of the people met again to lay plans for putting Jesus to death. Then they bound him, led him away, and took him to Pilate, the Roman governor. Now it was the governor's custom each year during the Passover celebration to release one prisoner to the crowd, anyone they wanted. This year, there was a notorious prisoner, a man named Barabbas. As the crowds gathered before Pilate's house that morning, he asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? He knew very well that the religious leaders had arrested Jesus out of envy. Just then, as Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him this message, Leave that innocent man alone. I suffered through a terrible nightmare about him last night. Meanwhile, the leading priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas to be released and for Jesus to be put to death. So the governor asked again, Which of these two do you want me to release to you? 
The crowd shouted back, Barabbas. Pilate responded, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? They shouted back, Crucify him. Why, Pilate demanded, what crime has he committed? But the mob roared even louder, Crucify him. Father of the abused and abandoned, forgive us when we join the crowds of belittlement and hate. On this morning, we remember how Christ was rejected by those he taught, yet still died for us all. We thank you that when others insult us, betray us, and dehumanize us, you are the voice of hope, reminding us of the beautiful, valued person you made us to be. Would you please join us in singing, Shall We Gather at the River, on page 723.
35 to 40 and 45 to 54 continue on by saying, So Pilate released Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged with a lead tipped whip. They turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. Some of the governor's soldiers told Jesus, took Jesus to their headquarters and called out the entire regiment. They stripped him and put a scar, scarlet robe on him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on his head, and they placed a reed stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery and held, taunted, it, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and stuck, struck him on the head with it. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put on his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. After they nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head announcing the charge against him. It read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their hands in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. At noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Mima, Sobachini, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Then Jesus shouted out again, and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many, many godly men and women who died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman soldier and other officers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that happened. They said, This man truly was the Son of God. Lord of the hurting and the helpless, on this morning we thank Christ for being beaten so we can be, have safe love and trust in you, for being insulted so we can find love that thinks of us first, for being killed so we can live forever in your presence. We thank you for, your, for such a sacrificial love that is truly boundless. Would you please join us in singing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on page 298.
For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled aside the stone, and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just like he said it would happen. Come see where his body was lying, and now go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Remember what I have told you. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were frightened, but also with great joy, and they rushed to give the disciples the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they ran to him, grasped his feet, and worshipped him. My friends, Christ is risen, and God of life, we on this morning thank you for defeating death on our behalf, so we never have to fear it again. We thank you for defeating sin, so it never has to own us again. And we thank you so much for loving us enough to go through all this for us. And all God's children said, Amen. Jesus is alive, alive forevermore. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. that the church has grappled for generations with explaining what it is Christ actually did for us. What, what happened on the cross? How did that function? Um, if you've been with us in worship the last few months, you know that we've been saying it's like this beautiful, amazing painting that no matter how many times you try to explain, no matter how many analogies you come up with, it always feels like it falls short. You just, you never quite grasp it all, you know. Well, we've talked about the reconciliation theory. That, that, that Christ, though we are the ones that broke our relationship with God, it's like, it's like we lied to our best friend. How that feels when somebody lies to us, especially someone we feel like we can trust. It's like when we steal, we stole from our best friend. We're the ones that cheated. We're the ones that manipulated. And yet he came to reconcile and make peace with us. Well, we talked about the fact that, that death is what, or sin is what separates us from God, 
and, and the wages of sin, the results of sin is death. But, but it's like we're being convicted of every bad thing we've ever done. We've been sentenced and Jesus took our place. He said, put the shame and the guilt on me. Here's one more theory that, that we haven't explored yet. I'm going to call this the Canaan theory, okay? My name is Pastor Cain, so yeah, it's my theory. Um, but this is just a collection of many things that, that, that I've received over the years. We are made in the image of God. And, 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 and when we sinned, we, we marred that image. We, we tainted it. We stained it, if you will. Okay. Um... But Jesus came and he lived a perfect life. And yet, if the wages of sin, if the results, the consequences of sin, is death, and Jesus died, he paid the consequences for something he never did. And so, just like going to jail for something you never did, it could not hold on to him. He was, he was released, he was emancipated, and so, death broke. And because we are made in the image of God, you are made in the image of God. You hold sacred value to God. And you can never stop being made in the image of God. Therefore, you can never stop holding value to Him. When we invite Him into our hearts, a little bit of God indwells within us, the Bible says. And therefore, that, that ability to overcome death, that the fact that death broke, dwells in us. Y'all, this is how we get to go to heaven. This is how we get a personal, ongoing relationship with our God. This is what it means for us to have new life, not just once, but over and over again. Every time we seek to, to pray and, and to ask for forgiveness and to sing praise to God and read Scripture, that's that excitement, that joy, y'all. That is what we celebrate this morning. So I invite you to go. Go and see what it is about the new life-giving light breaking of the darkness, flowers on the cross bringing new life, reconciling, healing, hopeful, eternal love of God, whatever image that speaks into your soul, I invite you to hold on to that today. Live into that and thank God for that. Receive that as your mission and your blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.